So Thad, I was saying earlier that this is a difficult interview. <laughs> and it's a difficult interview, I was saying, it's easier to interview Duchamp because it's work where the questions are kind of baked in as opposed to a show where it's kind of, it, it speaks for itself. <laughs> you know, as lame as that might sound, but you actually achieved that. Well, uh, that's one of my endeavors for many, many years because people always want to know how and why did you do this? How does this happen? And what is the secret of this? And of course, there's no mystery, there's no secret, there's just determination and perseverance and a little vision, but the main thing is pounding away till you get something finished. Uh, so, uh, and I always say I would like that uh, people look at something or look at my own work and get something from it themselves because there's all, in, in anything to me of interest, there's a bit of mystery. And, and so it's up to the individual to figure out what the mystery is and what they see in, in, for themselves. And you know, there's a constant flux, there's a constant change, and I don't care anywhere you move something, uh, hopefully a, a piece of mind that looks different in a different setting, and, and, and maybe it's a little more dramatic in one spot than it is in another. And anyone that has art, I think that is the joy of moving stuff around. I, I have a little tiny house and maybe about 50, 60 sculptures in it. <laughs> and of course I have a storage room on the third floor. But anyhow, I'm always moving stuff. stuff the great big things, which I don't move anymore. I'm getting up in age. But when I was younger, I moved stuff all the time. And I know anyone that sets up a show, that set up this show, they probably had a time making a decision where this would go or where that would go. Uh, yeah. Well, I thought I would try, um, try something a little different and save questions about the pieces in any formal or technical sense for the, for the end. Um, but I'd actually like to, to, to do a little uh, a detour, detour, is it a detour, into biography a little bit. And starting with your age, actually. Now, I know you were born in, in 1926. Oh yeah, which is you know I mean it's hard to, hard to believe. I was telling Susan, I said, I said, man, you won't believe this, Susan. That cat is he's about to turn ninety seven, and you were like, no. I said, no, 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 uh, no, no. The closer you get to him, the younger he will appear. Actually, <laughs> it's incredible. You know, there is something beyond being an OG, and we should be lucky enough to find out what that is. You know. So you are more than an OG. But I was wondering, in terms of by way of detour, 1926, and I was quite impressed that you were able to rattle off your cohort, <laughs> let's call them, at least musically. Yeah, so it was yeah. a very fine year, a vintage year, let's call it. So who was in your cohort uh, uh, in 1926? Well, Miles Davis, uh, for starters. Well, there was a, a group of people born in 1926 Ray Brown, who was a Pittsburgher, and I knew Ray, Ray Brown, and there's Joe Harris, who, who uh, the drummer Ray Brown took to New York when Ray Brown was 19 to play with Dizzy Gillespie. So there was Lou Donaldson, Jimmy Heath, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, and Lee Konitz, they were Lee all, Konitz is 20, they were all born in 1926. And there was many other people born naturally in <laughs> 1926. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't the only ones. <laughs> but, but That's all you get. And, and that would be okay. It's a quality, <laughs> not quantity. <laughs> yeah. And fortunately, I knew all these people. I knew, I, of course, I like people talk about train. I said, well, I must have heard him play 25 times or so. Yeah. Because uh, he came to, after he and Miles group broke up, 
He came to Pittsburgh and played at the grill. He was there for two weeks. And there was a buddy of mine played Bob named Rabbit Barnes. We had a group of uh, jazz fanatics, and we went every night. And uh, I was, at that time, I worked in the Postal Service 40 years. At that time, I was working from 11 o'clock to 7 o'clock in the morning. When the clubs opened up at 9, I'd go to work two hours early every night, always did, and listen to whoever was playing. Max Roach, Clifford Brown at the uh, Midway. And I want to tell you, you know, people think uh, us old first people are nostalgic and we say things are now aren't, aren't what they was. But I can tell you, it's not been nostalgic. There's not close to an atmosphere that it was when Clifford Brown and Max Roach took the stage, or Miles Davis and Coltrane took the, ta took the stage, or Coltrane. You don't have, I, you know, and I don't care who you are, there's no intensity or, or, or no mystery or, or, or no joy like it was in those days. And even playing the records, you can find that. You don't find oh, yeah. any, anything like that. And Modern Jazz Quartet, when they Milton them, took the stage. And I was very, we well, always were very fortunate that it was so, uh, uh, we, we, they were so close to, to this music, to these musicians. I knew them all. Did you call them magicians? Huh? Did you call them musicians? Oh, I yeah. thought you said magicians. I like and, that too. And then, <laughs> you know, like there was Art Blakey, who was from Pittsburgh. A lot of people were from Pittsburgh, Turn Team Brothers yeah. and so forth. So I only had to walk across the street to hear these people play. But unfortunately, like in many situations, people don't realize this is going to vanish pretty soon. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So I know. Oh, before I forget, and I've got to mention this this morning, one of the first things I think of when I think about, you know, your generation in Pittsburgh, did you know Teeny Harris? I knew Teeny well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teeny I worked Harris, on the same paper with right, Teeny. The Pittsburgh Courier. Teeny <laughs> Harris was the photographer, main photographer for the Pittsburgh Courier. The Pittsburgh Courier was the, the, the most widely circulated black newspaper in the country in what 30s 40s well, 50s not only the, it was the most widely circulated weekly in the country weekly yeah. <laughs> and, and although it's a teeny uh when i graduated from university of pittsburgh in 1950 when most of you weren't even in the cradle i would say <laughs> i went to work for the corps because there were three white papers in, in, in Pittsburgh at the time, but they hired no Afro-Americans as most places did. I don't care what you graduated from. You, 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 uh, but I went to work for the Courier. I was even doing some spots and whatnot while I was in college. So I became, I had a column and, and, uh, called From the Sidelines back in those days. And of course, Teeny was the general photographer, and I don't think any photographer in the world took as many pictures as Teeny Harris. Yeah, it was like 80,000 or something in his archive. The most energetic person I've ever seen. You talking about the energy bunny? I don't know when that guy, he had a little studio, but he took pictures up and down night and day. And I have a lot of them, I have some signed by him. And, uh, but a lot of times, uh, he would say, Mosley, you got to take your own pictures tonight. I'm busy. I can't take your pictures. <laughs> so I had a little rolly, two, two and a quarter by two and a quarter. So I took a lot of pictures of my own pictures. Yeah. So before, so 1926 you're born. I know the sports is very important to you. And this figures in a later chapter in your life as uh, it relates to the Pittsburgh Courier. Um, but could you talk a little bit about your, your, your teenage years in sports as a kind of early inspiration? Well, you know, if you grew up in Western Pennsylvania, uh, 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 you know, uh, it was one big 
athletic factory, you know, we had, out, out of that mix, uh, there was Bill Bass from Monongahela, uh, there was Tony Dorsett, Joe Namath, Jim Kelly, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the guy from New Eagle played for San Francisco, was the quarterback from San Francisco in their heyday. Um, oh, Joe Montana? Was it Joe, Joe Montana, he was from Monongahela. We had so many athletes, uh, George Blander from uh, Youngwood near Greensburg. We had so many athletes that uh, people ask me now, did you have art in high school? I said, we only had three arts, and that was basketball, football, and track. <laughs> 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 and everybody that wanted to participate, unfortunately, they had no, no women uh, sports, uh, athletics in high school, but they had in, in Sandlot sports. They had, women's softball and so forth, and basketball and so forth. But uh, the, uh, we only had two things, music and, and athletics. And I started out in junior high. And back in junior high, I was captain of the basketball team. And people said, what? Five foot two. <laughs> yard. Uh, uh, but you know, people forget Moxie Bogues, he was five foot three like me. When, but when I went to high school, they, they said, who's coming up? I said, we have Mosley. And they said, what? That little guy, we, we don't want him. So I didn't play basketball, but I ran track. I was like a, a relay specialist. And people don't know what relay specialists were. Back in those days, they had relays after relays. And so I specialized in 220 and a quarter mile. Guys were faster than I was, but they weren't stronger. I was one, for my size, I was one of the strongest guys in my high school. We used to do, back in those days, they didn't lift weights, but we did calisthenics. And I could do 100 pull-ups at one time, chin-ups, and very few other kids could. So the coach used to say, when I came out on the field, here comes Body Beautiful. <laughs> because I knew I had to compensate for all those big, tall, strong guys I made up in strength and endurance. So at the relays, I had a buddy of mine that was six foot two, was really our fastest 220 and quarter miler, but he had a tendency to fade in the 50 yard finish. So the coach would say, Mosley, you, you're gonna run anchor on all three relays a day. And so he'd say, why am I not an anchor? I said, because you get tired. One thing about me, I never got tired. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> and still going. Yeah. So, you went into the Army. I take you were drafted Navy. in the Navy, Navy, in the Navy, in the Navy, yeah. in, 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 in 44. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you go into the Navy, you're drafted, and you get out, and you've got the GI Bill. Yeah. And I think what you said about the GI Bill was really, was really a, 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 a an interesting take about black GIs and the GI Bill, and especially as it relates to you going on to college, to university, and also what you said about the civil service and working for the postal service. But I was wondering if you talk a little bit about the, what you said just about the GI Bill and, and its availability for, for black soldiers, you know, and that it was, it was, um, it was, it was there, but in terms of who, who could really take advantage of it? Well, you know, uh, I, I, like I was telling you this morning, yeah, when I was in the Navy, I wrote a play, it was the only play I, I've ever oh, yeah. written. And the play was based on the, you know, we were over in Peleliu in the South Pacific, and guys were talking about what they're gonna do 
when they got out. And of course, I had always thought about going to college, even when I was in high school, because I tell the story, uh, uh, you know, when I first went up to senior high school, they'd say, well, we only had six Afro-Americans that were in my graduating class. So we went up, they said, oh, well, those black kids, they, they don't do anything and so forth. And I heard a teacher say that, and I said, what do you mean? So that, I said, that propelled me on the honor roll for the next three years. I said, all you had to do is offer me a challenge. Oh, what? I'll show you. Uh, you know, I'm as smart as anyone around, you know. But a lot of these guys were talking about what they're going to do, but a lot of them had dropped out very early. A lot of them were in situations where they had memorable ed education. I talked to guys that came from Georgia. They went to school about two or three months out of the year because the rest of the time everyone was working. And, and so my idea was that you're not going to be able to take advantage of these educational opportunities simply because you don't have the background to, to do it. So these things helped, uh, uh, but also not a lot of situations came up in where if you applied for a house on the job bill as a black person, the, the, those neighborhoods were Red line, Red line again. She, yeah. You could not, but, but even though you were a GI, but white guys. In fact, I can tell you, I had a supervisor tell me that I can get you a house right where I am. Here is the address and whatnot. <laughs> I get over there, and and they say, "Oh no, this is just for veterans that came out of this neighborhood." Well, they knew no black people came out of that neighborhood, so that automatically eliminated me or anyone else. But, but, but I always to tell people, without the civil service, we would never had a, a, a black middle class because private corporations weren't going to hire you. But also, we were a, um, what I, I, I say, a, 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 a bargain. We, uh, uh, for, for the federal government, they could get expertise at the cheapest rate in the world because a white person with the same credentials as I had wasn't going to work for the government mm -hmm. unless they were like coming in at top range. So, so all of us, we had, and like in the post office, we had, you could go in the post office, you could find engineers. Our main engineer graduated from Carnegie Mellon, and he fixed all the electricity, the running belts, and everything because he could not get a job in a private engineering company. So you got the GI Bill, and then you, you go to college, University of Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and you study writing, in journalism. Yeah, double major, English and journalism. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and you, 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 did you say what the play was about? You did mention what the no, play was about. No, I never. Okay. I Fortunately, play? that play disappeared on television. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you were in college, you had Wendell Smith as a, as a was he a teacher? Wendell Smith was, you no. Know, when, uh, when I talk about Wendell Smith, uh, uh, Wendell Smith was the senior. Because uh, uh, he was at the Courier. Up at the Courier. Right. And when I came aboard in 1950, Wendell had gone and Bill Nunn became uh, uh, the editor. Uh, what Wendell Smith did, I guess most of you have seen the movie The Green Book. What Wendell Smith did, Jack, when Jackie Robinson came in, he took, he was Jackie Robinson's companion. Because Jackie Robinson didn't travel with the Brooklyn Dodgers. He traveled by, tra by train and he slept in black neighborhood houses because back in those days, 
you know, you know that's what blacks did, bands, whoever you were. America was so segregated. So Wendell Smith being uh, uh, the, the national uh, sports editor for the Courier, he knew everywhere to go to take black athletes. So for a whole year, he took Jackie Robinson around for about a year and a half. You stay in this hotel, you eat in this restaurant, and you ride this bus. And, and, and so I became like the city sports editor. Bill Nunn uh, Jr. was the uh, national sports writer. And of course, anyone that came into the major leagues at that time, like Larry Dovey, Luke Easter, they all came to Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh was the head of black newspaper at that time. Mm -hmm. So, but you did know Wendell Smith. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And now Wendell Smith, is, is, he wasn't just his companion in terms of travel. Wendell Smith was like the fire yeah. devoted to integrating the Major League Baseball. So he, when he was a college pitcher, he won this major game, talent scout was there, talent scout said, I would sign you for the major leagues, but I can't. Yeah. And then he hired the white pitcher who had lost the game. <laughs> and so then Wendell Smith said, all right, this is a life's mission. <laughs> and so he strategized and they landed on figuring Jackie Robinson was the one to be able to break the barrier. So yeah. Wendell Smith is like both his travel yeah. companion, but he's also the kind of like, yeah, he, you know, brain trust and inspiration for integrating the major yeah, leagues. Yeah, he That's, was one of the most uh, in the forefront in battle uh, fighter. I can remember you know, telling you when I was in high school, we were talking about we had public speaking, and and I don't know if they still have public speaking you know, and courses in high school anymore. But my last public speech was about Afro Americans being capable of playing Major League Baseball. So my English teacher says, well, what are your footnotes and, and, and who are you talking about? What references and, and you, do you have? I, I had Wendell Smith <laughs> and, uh, and so, who had been long ad ad advocating that uh, uh, Afro-Americans and, and those of you who might remember Stan Musial from the Cardinals. How many people remember Stan Musial? By name. Very few you know. people. Yeah. By name, yeah. Okay, well, Stan Musial was one of the greatest baseball players of all time. And they called him Stan the Man. And so they were saying, oh, uh, Cardinals got the greatest baseball player that came out of the Monongahela Valley. He said, no, you didn't. Buddy Griffey is the greatest, is better than I am, but no one will hire him because he's black. Now, you don't know who Buddy Griffey is, but you know who Ken Griffey, two his sons were. Ken, Ken, his son and his grandson, Ken Griffey Jr., the second, and Ken Griffey the third. Everyone, who knows who Ken Griffey is? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well those, Griffey, yeah. His, grandpa, his grandfather was Buddy Griffey, who was considered the best baseball player in Western Pennsylvania, ahead of Stan Musial. But that's what racism was, and still is a good bit, because we're still having that. That's why we have the, the political situation that we are. They talk about party divide. But it's still about race, you know, if people really want to admit it, you know. Yeah. So you study writing, journalism, and are you working for the, for the Post at that time, or the, the Postal Service at the time? Uh, yeah, I had so many yeah. jobs at one time. Well, uh, first thing is, but when I worked at the Courier, I had a dark room. But I, before I started there, when I was in college, I used to do, um, uh, uh, I was a darkroom technician. Back in those days, a lot of, most of the photography was black and white. And I did my, uh, my own pictures for the courier. I did other people's uh, uh, photography. 
So, but after I left and went to the post office, I still worked part time at, at, the, at the photo guild, and I still worked part time at the courier for a while. And then I decided, if meanwhile, I'm doing sculpture. So I decided well, I'm gonna cut out two jobs and just do sculpture and work in the post office. <laughs> right, so, so but coming to sculpture, you, you came, and now we can segue into the art part of things and still keep it biographical. You were going to the Carnegie Museum with a friend from, from, from university. Yeah. And, and so in part, that was a real, um, uh, and your friend, he wanted to be a painter. Yeah, he was, he yeah. was a good painter, but he was taking, uh, he, uh, he was becoming a so, uh, sociologist because he wanted to have a job when he graduated because back in those days, it, there was very little prospects for anyone that was pursuing a, a, a degree in art. In fact, even as now, I guess if you want to start a family controversy, you just tell your parents, I'm going to be an artist. <laughs> 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 so, and you can imagine when there was uh, far less uh, avenues to pursue if you went to college, because everyone had the idea, the idea of going to college was that you were able to get a job. But the idea, of course, if you really wanted a job, you go to plumbing school or you go to electrical school, you're guaranteed. You're going to have a job because everyone needs lights and everyone needs plumbing. Mm. They don't need much else, you know. Mm. So, uh, but so, yeah, so this buddy of mine, he was really a fine painter, but uh, we we had interest in music and stuff. So we would go, particularly through the internationals. We had a guy named Washburn and Leon Arcus, and in those days, they individually picked the international. So we'd always go and see what we thought was the most progressive or the most interesting and the most daring art. And that sort of got me sort of interested in thinking, not about doing art, but being interested in art. Right, right. And now, you, I'd ask you a question, um, and I thought it was telling in terms of about African art. And, and it was great because I had put it at a later date. Let's say I'd put it in the 60s. And you said, no, 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 no. My introduction to African art actually came through the university. <laughs> and you got, it was a twofer. It was Broncusi and African art, <laughs> like, you know, so. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, um, about the introduction to both of those things, which would be sort of a, you know, uh, 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 an inspiration, you know, throughout the... the well, you know, uh, African tribal art wasn't shown when I was coming, when I was in high school. In fact, no, no art was, but, uh, but when I was in college, I, 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 I got, took an advanced course, history course, on in world cultures. And so we're in the middle of the book. Well, the course was about how one culture related to another. Say how Japanese culture was taken up by the French and English and how the African culture was taken up by the French uh, and, and the Europeans. And they had a sculpture of Brancusi and a dance sculpture from Liberia. And they were talking about how Brancusi was influenced by tribal, uh, Afri African tribal arts. So I, I was telling um, Hamsha how I was talking not too long ago, when you hear them talk about Brancusi, now you don't see the pictures of the African influence like the king and the princess, his wooden carvings, you see his bird in space and that sort of thing. So I, I, I've gotten in so many controversies 
about this idea. And I said, well, you, you know, Picasso wasn't really revolutionary until he took up African tribal art. And when I did a, a talk down in West Virginia, West, Westland University, and when you go down to these small towns, you are the entertainment for the week. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had a, maybe a thousand students in the art, auditorium. I was showing slides talking about my interests and my influence in Brancusi and, 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 and uh, Picasso. So the dean of the art department said, uh, Picasso never admitted to having a, a Negro period in art. I said, admission means nothing. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, uh, there's no one that goes to jail very seldom say, yes, I did it. Everyone <laughs> says, no, I didn't get that from so-and-so. That's particularly mine. I know, I said, very people admit that. I said, well, okay. What I'll do is we'll go back and show some slides of African tribal masks, and we'll show some Mademoiselle Davion and some stuff that Picasso did that he claimed was Cubist. So we did that, and the students started applauding, and the dean ran out of the auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, and I've said this time and time again, that without African tribal art, there'd be no abstract art. And people look at me, that cannot be. I says, well, show me how it could be. You know, I'm willing to listen. I said, because everyone Father Picasso, Graw, and the rest of the people that Father Picasso, who I said, and the first thing is, when you talk about abstract expression, abstract expression started with African tribal art because the Africans knew how to abstract an expression. And that's where the real abstract expression came from. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's not just, uh, uh, what, what people don't realize, one reason for the justification of American apartheid, apartheid, any, everywhere, was pushing the idea, the propagating the idea that Blacks were in this situation because they didn't have ability. <laughs> they were inferior people, inferior intellect. But I was telling someone the other day, someone was asking me why jazz was important. I said, jazz is important because it changed the music of the world. I says, whether if you go into R&B, if you go in the rock, if you go in the hip hop, all this thing came from the beat of jazz, which came out of New Orleans. So when you start talking about um, etymology of things, you have to go to the roots, you know, which very few people do. <laughs> and the, the reason I was bringing, was bringing that up was to see it the, the its confluence with the rise of you know black nationalism right and the claiming you know if you're talking about a black aesthetic and how much of a black aesthetic you know uh, relies on you know African art and thinking that you like how much of your engagement with African art came via those politics 
in cultural politics. But it was interesting to hear that it kind of predated that, actually, <laughs> and that you got that and modernism at the same, the argument about its relationship to modernism, <laughs> you know, as a, as a way of, of, as the door. Well, you know, um, I, I, like you hear me speak of Leon Argus as the director of the Carnegie, you know, and, he, and one of his favorite phrases was, we all have ancestors. And when you look at who and what your ancestors, and most of these ancestors, whether they're uh, 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 <coughs> physical or cultural, they're all related, uh, 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 you know. And one thing about artists, they don't care where it comes from. They're not prejudiced. They'll use anything that will help their cause, uh, particularly if, if it'll boost the, their uh, uh, presence or really make them more known as an artist. So when someone hears or sees something, of course, I came along at a time when I was at my first show in 66 at the Carnegie Museum. I have scheduled, but the show didn't come out in 68. But at that time, it was a hotbed from the 60s to the 70s. If you weren't doing what a lot of Afro-Americans thought was black art, you were betraying your heritage. Well, I never felt that way. I felt that you did what you felt and what would really enhance your own art. So I never bought that. And of course, I knew people, as you knew people, who went through a lot of, <laughs> of turmoil because they weren't conforming strictly right. to what the people felt. If you weren't doing black images, well, I never did it. Very few images I did because my idea was based on the, uh, uh, the textures, the, uh, the process of African tribal art, the rhythms. When I like did this piece, I hope anyone that has seen a, 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 a figure from the uh, uh, Congo pieces, that you get a feeling that there is an, an African essence there, not an image, but, but, but a, a tribal essence. And same thing with the piece that's to the left. If you don't get a feeling of African animism out of that piece, it's no particular animal. But if you don't feel that, then you're missing not only my sculpture, but you're missing a good bit of what African tribal arts is about. <laughs> it's not about a race thing, it's about aesthetics, <clears throat> you know. And, and, and that's why in, in many on, early on, I ran into a lot of criticism. People say, well, you know, if you're doing that kind of stuff, and you're not doing black stuff, you can't show with us. I said, well, you just did me a favor. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't have to worry about you guys, you know. So were you, part, were you part of the abstract group at that time? Yes, I was. Yeah, and now that's a collective based in Pittsburgh. Yeah, that we strictly did abstraction. And that was the thing I was, in, I was always interested in how you could take, a, which the Africans were very good at, how you could take a very realistic imagery and, and change it into a mystery. And I hope, you know, that's one of the things you'll keep in mind as you walk around. People say, this looks like this, it looks like that. That's fine. You know, but the main thing, of course, I have the concept of weight 
in space. You always hear weight in space and all their stuff that they mix up. But that is a concept that I, I'm more, more interested in. Aesthetics, and you know, uh, when I think back at some of the people like Afro Kofu, I like some of the stuff these people did. I got to know Dana Chandler really well, mm -hmm. and who I always called the Black Panther painter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, out of Boston, you know, and he come and visit me and we talked and, and of course these people were very much into what they felt was starting black nationalism and so forth. And so I, I was telling them, I said, well, you know, uh, Dana, all these brothers you're helping and so forth, you know, you got to sort of concentrate on, uh, I, I said, I think you really have a vision. I think uh, I, I like your choice of colors and all that, and your painting technique, but some of this stuff, and I always remember, like James Baldwin, one of my favorite writers said, well, you know, what binds these people together right now is the white foot on his neck. But that isn't always going to be. So what are you going to do when that disappears, if that's the only thing you're interested in? Mm -hmm. now, and now, I mean, I'm totally interested in this period-wise in terms of those kinds of you know, contentions, let's call them. <laughs> and those, the, the, the politics of representation mm -hmm. as it was played out in a very turbulent time. Yeah. But it's always interesting in terms of your generation and how they negotiated with abstraction, right? But that is, those politics are not to be confused with your actual activism, yeah. right? So That's you were true. with you know, the NAACP out on the front line. Well, that, that's true. I mean, like, uh, of course, like all of us, on some, on some level, we're, we were all involved in picketing and so forth, and, and, and particularly uh, talking about the economic situation. And my argument has always been, unless you can raise the bottom, of anything, there's not going to be, but, but but so much advancement or whatever else you call it, be, because to raise, because uh, you can always get four or five people out, out of any situation that can so-called make it, mm -hmm. but as long as you have millions and other, millions and millions of other people in the same situation that didn't make it, that's not really any progress. Right. Yeah, 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 you know. Uh, so so, uh, so that, that was, and I can tell a story about when I, I worked in the Postal Service, and of course, you know, it's always curious, you know, about protests and whatnot. And I don't care, and I can't remember any situation where Afro-Americans protested against a situation that wasn't considered radical and dangerous. And, and you could not get, of course, a more uh, peaceful <laughs> and really, I call it, self-inflicting <laughs> man than Martin Luther King. <laughs> but they still said he's radical and dangerous. And Jay, who said the most dangerous man in the world. Now, I'm working for the federal government, and I'm picketing Duquesne Light, and I'm picketing a U.S. steel worker, building buildings, and there are no Afro-Americans. So, at, at lunch, I didn't eat lunch. We had a group that didn't eat lunch. And after work, we'd go out and picket the, the, these different things about jobs. So one day, the postmaster calls us in and said, we have you, you, and you down there as the ringleaders picketing. Now, if you get arrested and, 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 and you go to jail, you're going to lose your fire from the post office. That was a way of, of, of uh, uh, negating us as a threat 
uh, or as a force. So now I had children. I couldn't afford to get fired. <laughs> for, for, the only reason I took the job was because it was steady and I didn't have to worry about when I was going to get paid. <laughs> and so I had to quit picketing, you know. So, so, but if they can do that, the, the, the people that are in charge, they can nullify almost anybody if, if, if they decide that's what they want to do. If you, but there were people who were single, and I applaud these people who, regardless of anything, stayed out there in the front lines, you know? And that's why I say, you know, uh, people talk about Martin Luther King, and people like that, Harry Belfonte, and people that put their lives and careers out there in the front, you know. Uh, but I did what I could back in those days, you know. Okay, I'm just going to check the, the time. Oh, so, okay. Okay. So, fast forward one step back from your activities in 69. Your show in 66, it's a success. Well, <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, really, I want to define success. <laughs> but in terms of New York came calling. Yes. And knocking and saying, hey, why don't you come up to New York? That's true. And, and so you decided to stay. Well, you know, like I always, you know, every, you have to look at your own perspective. You know, my mother and father divorced when I was eight years old. And from that time on, my life took a very different turn uh, because when you're poor and you only have really one family, one person in the family that's really making money and supporting the family, when that support disappears, time becomes very tough. So, but anyhow, I always said to myself, you know, if, if I had children, and I did this very early on because of my own experience, if I ever have children, I'm going to put them first so far as support and money is concerned. And, of course, I always know people who, because of certain ambition, decide they weren't going to do that. But they didn't have my personal experience because uh, uh, I recently had talked to a, a, a very wealthy man, talked to me, he said, well, he's spoiling his kids, giving them too much money and all like that. And, and I, of course, he didn't make the money, he inherited the money. <laughs> but if a lot of people inherit the money, they feel they made it, you know. <laughs> they didn't. So I said, well, when it comes to your children, they didn't ask to come here. It is your job to see you give them every opportunity and chance that you can do anything that they can do. They need help. It's your job to see that they are supported in any way you can support them. And I'm not, I never claim to be the best father in the world. I don't think there's a way that any really young person who got married when they're 21 years old knows anything about raising children or anything else much. But, but I did what I, what I felt I had to do, and particularly main thing, keeping my kids out of jail and getting into that prison system that is so prevalent among Afro-Americans, young kids who really don't know what their potentials are and never had a chance during trouble at the time, they're 15, 16, and they just go down, down the well, so to speak. So that played a lot of uh, what I wanted to do so far as with my career. Now they offered me two galleries, Seidenberg and Lefebvre. Said, well, why don't you come to New York? We like your work. I said, well, I have to transfer and take a, a, my job in the post office here to New York. He said, oh, no, you can't have a job. <laughs> you have to spend all your time on sculpture. But no one said, well, what am I going to do 
uh, uh, beside Cottonwood, and when I'm going to eat the chips, uh, my kids going to eat sawdust. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know. And I realized it wasn't about me or my children. And coming up to the point, people always ask me, well, why did you sign with Karma? I said, yeah, there were other people who came all along after the National. I signed with Karma because we were talking the same language about what happens with my children and so forth. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So fast forward, 72, and you meet Sam Gilliam. And at a, at, a, at, a, at a dinner party, yeah. a cocktail event. And I bring this up by way of networks. And I think, you know, black networks at that time yeah. would have been, well, they're always crucial, but yeah. particularly if you've made the decision to stay in Pittsburgh, yeah. you know. And could you talk a little bit about that meeting and how it came about and what the circumstances were? Because I think it's quite revealing, you know, and some of the other artists that you would meet around that time. Well, you know, Sam came to Pittsburgh. There used to, used to be a gallery near, right near, on Craig Street, right near the Carnegie. And they brought in a lot of, uh, of artists, well-known artists, but they didn't, of course, bring in many Afro-American artists. So they brought in Sam. They had a big party. So at that time, or almost any time, very few white people had Afro-American friends, and they didn't know, but they knew me, and they and so uh, they said, "Oh, we're having a big thing for Sam Gilman. Will, will you come? We don't know many other Afro-American artists, and we want some Afro-Americans to be there." So that's when I came and uh, came and met Sam. Of course, like you and I, we talked about jazz and different musicians that were playing down Blues Alley and Jim Georgetown and all those different people he knew. And we knew some of the same people. So we got to be really, really great buddies. And, uh, say, and the same thing with Richard Hunt. I have got to know Richard pretty much the same way. And, and of course, the main thing too, I guess, is there is respect and admiration among any artist for other artists whose work they like and so forth, or they can see the, the, the endeavor and perseverance and so forth. And of course, like Sam, you know, people think because you're very, very famous, you're, you're, you're very, very wealthy. That does not mm. not the case, and of course, going back to the situation where, uh, uh, particularly in the seventies, when Sam was mainly always been mainly an abstractionist, there are a lot of people, prominent Afro Americans, putting him down for not doing black art. Mm -hmm. Said he was going to be picketed and all this stuff. And for long, for a while, Sam did not have a gallery as, as prominent as he was. And a lot of people always felt he was at the same level all the time, but that was not true. And even, even Richard Hunt had some of the same problems. Mm -hmm. But except Richard Hunt was a commission sculptor, so he, he was doing commissions and he wasn't, Although, although he showed in galleries and stuff, but his main income came from big commissions, so it wasn't uh, 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 predicated so much on, uh, uh, on black popularity or endorsement. So that was the situation. Yeah. So I think at this point we can open it up to questions from the floor, I think, in terms of saving the the technical and the formal, <laughs> how you do what you do, not necessarily why, <laughs> uh, but the what and the how. The kind of two-part question. So when did you decide to choose wood as a medium, or a primary medium? 
one, and then two, if you're going to translate this medium into bronze. I mean, a lot of these would be just extraordinary bronze. Oh, well, these are bronze. These no. are, okay, good. Okay. Everything in this, well, I'll start back at the Genesis. So, uh, you know, living in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania stands for woods. But, and there, and if you want wood, you just come to Pennsylvania, there's tons and tons of it. Used to be, until the mills went down and they start, people own, a lot of start selling the, the trees off to lumber companies. But also, we have what they call a park service. And a lot of, so the park service, when storms or trees, uh, they would cut them down and put them in piles. So you had trees that were there, you didn't have to pay a penny for it. You just load them in your car or truck or whatnot, and you could make sculpture. As so if you were, and one, one thing about carving, you don't need many tools. All you need is a metal and a chisel and a gouge, and you can go and you're in business. <laughs> Whereas if, you, if you're a painter, you need paints, brushes, all kinds of stuff. At least that's what they teach you in college. You need t tons of stuff. And same thing if you're doing welding and stuff like that. You need all kinds of equipment, but you don't need. So I had, this is very, very handy and very r r ready. So what turned me into bronze was Brendan and, and all these people sitting in the front row here. <laughs> <laughs> they, they decided that we, we could uh, expand our presence by putting stuff outdoors. I've done some wood outdoors, but you need constant maintenance, which very few people want to provide. Uh, uh, so, um, so we so we started doing bronzes for not only now but for the future. But wood was always. I mean, you started in wood. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm still yeah. doing a lot of wood. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The but pieces. From wood to bronze, at what point did that occur? What was the impetus behind that? The motivation behind that? Like, oh, like, that was just three years ago, right? That you yeah, made the bronze. Uh, yeah. How long ago did you make it? Okay. Yeah. Right. No, yeah, a lot of them are early works. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, these are earlier works. And the woods in the other room are pieces I did during the pandemic when everyone was complaining about being locked down. I, I was locked in. <laughs> and so, except for being able to go to a restaurant, or to a club, because clubs aren't what they used to be. So I have tons of records and I tons of words. So every day, except not seeing people on the streets and stuff, I was in the studio uh, uh, doing so. And I guess what I do, about 16, 17 large pieces in three years, that's not bad for old man in the 90s, right? So, yeah. Yeah. That's what I was doing. I would say, drop and give me 20. <laughs> drop and give me three more sculptures. <laughs> I know you got it. <laughs> but it's interesting just knowing, I mean, these are hardwood, and, and, you know, versus you know, the technical dimensions of you. Um, uh, in some sense, being self-taught, hmm. and 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 you know, learning along the way, you know. But these are are these walnut in the other room. I I, I use you know as I when I first started, I worked in any kind of wood I could find, Be, you know. But as I got a little money and got more particular, I start using hardwoods. So now most is cherry and walnut. And for a while, you couldn't get much cherry because most of that was going to Japan and China. Because you got to remember, you know, the resources in America, particularly in West Virginia, wood-wise, a lot of countries don't have. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember we did the Sculpture International in Pittsburgh uh, maybe 20 years ago. And we have with boats going down the river, we were entertaining people from Japan, China, Hungary, everywhere else. 
And they come down the river and they say, look at the trees, look at the trees, look at the trees. And we were wondering what they were talking about because we always had those trees. Uh, yeah, so, but, uh, 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 but another thing is, you know, uh, it's something that you have to want to do, you know. Uh, uh, if you think that, if you get up and you think this is going to be labor, well, you are definitely in the wrong, at the wrong party. This is like something you want to get up every day. Every day I get up. I got a bum finger for about two or three weeks, so I haven't been able to do much carving. I'm looking and studying at, at the stuff. But like going back to the idea, you're talking about self-thought, people being, people make a lot of noise about people being self-thought. I say, everybody's self-taught. Do, do you think someone taught Picasso to do those cubism sculptures and paintings? <laughs> no, he taught himself to do that. And same way with the, every, everybody else, like Sam Gilliam, he went to college, but no one taught him to do those great paintings and stuff. He taught himself. So I always tell people, what do you do when the teacher goes home? You stop <laughs> painting? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting, you, one of your early inspirations, like kind of a moment, was actually Scandinavian <laughs> furniture. Yeah. Which I, which I, Scandinavian furniture. Yeah. And seeing a show of yeah. Scandinavian furniture. And what, you know, just the, um, I mean, there's their maidness, right? The carved. Uh, but the moments where they're, the joinery that's in them. But there's a sense of, of, of uh, what's it, a joy in, in the work. Well, the main thing that, that, that influenced me, or impressed me about Scandinavian the furniture displays was that they had sculptures with the displays. Now you can look at almost in any ad in American furniture, uh, uh, you don't see any any sculpture, but 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 the Swedish and the Danes they had birds, fish, even abstract human forms. And I said, yeah, that's what you need with furniture, some sculpture. And any of you that don't have any sculpture, you're in the right place, right? Uh, so uh, that's where. Uh, my, my, my emphasis came from that. And I like that, but it, it, I mean, it's going to be a silly question. Oh. But was the sculpture was the was the sculpting on the furniture, or was it actually in the display? In the display. Oh, that's even more whack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I really yeah. try to dig it, that. That, it's that, like... that was one thing. In all the display, they had some sculpture. Now another <laughs> thing about uh, uh, Danish and. and uh, Scandinavian furniture, Swedish furniture, was the sculptural look of the furniture. And now people don't think of that ordinarily when they just think of it as a nice looking chair. But almost every piece of Danish or Scandinavian furniture, and you could all even go back to say even African tribal art furniture, is sculpture. Right. And so these Danes and, and Swedes, they made sculpture that you could sit on. <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing just because the, also the, 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 what's going on is kind of a very funny <laughs> reverse appropriation. <laughs> it's like, yeah, Picasso looked at an African mask. He's like, yeah, I can get with that. And you're looking at a Scandinavian furniture display. Like, yeah, I can get with that. <laughs> and this time, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole idea of like art in one's life, like looking at you know, you know, tribal societies and see the integration of art into their lives, and then they look at the Scandinavians and be like, look at that art in their lives. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Well, thank you for being attentive, and I hope I've been 
slightly enlightening, you know, yeah, <laughs> and a little bit revealing. So, okay. yeah, I'm glad you're out and hope you enjoy every, some of the stuff you see. Thank you so much. Yeah.